cattle emissions are a very, very small percentage of our greenhouse gas emissions. So worldwide, they make up only 5% of greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation, um, energy production, consumerism, manufacturing, all of this is way bigger than cow farts. So that's number one. And it's actually not even cow farts, it's cow belching. That's the problem. Hey guys, today our guest is Diana Rogers. Diana Rogers is a real food licensed registered dietitian nutritionist living on a working organic farm. Diana writes and speaks about the intersection of optimal human nutrition, environmental sustainability, animal welfare, and social justice. Diana is also the producer of the Sustainable Dish podcast, interviewing experts in the environmental and health movement. She regularly presents at numerous nutrition and agriculture conferences, both in the US and at international level. She is also the author of the book Sacred Cow, where she makes a thoughtful and in-depth examination of the nutritional, environmental and ethical controversies surrounding meat in the modern world. Also, Diana released a documentary called Sacred Cow, which is a must watch for those who are willing to truly see the things as they are. I am very happy to invite Diana Rogers to the show. Thanks, Diana, for coming to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Before we go into the first questions, can you say where can people connect with you? And can you also talk about the film a little bit? Yes. Uh, so I'm most active on social media on Instagram. And my handle on Instagram is Sustainable Dish. I also have uh, two websites. My nutrition website is sustainabledish.com, but then the one for the Sacred Cow Project is www.sacredcow.info. Um, the film, I believe, is not currently being shown in India. Um, it is available in many countries on iTunes, um, it, all over the world, uh, starting this month in January. Uh, and it's also in America, it's on Amazon as well. So I hope that, um, you know, we're able to make this available. Certainly the information that's uh, in the film can all be also found on my website. So that should be accessible to you guys. Thank you, Diana. Diana, who benefits and who loses when we vilify meat? That's a good question. So, um, he, you know, it, it's, it's a little different in other countries, but here in, in America, it's definitely the ultra processed food companies. Um, when all of our negative dietary attention is pinned on cows, uh, then it makes uh, all these other plant-based ultra processed foods seen as healthier, uh, especially the, the fake meat like Beyond Burger and Impossible Burger, which uh, claim to be healthier and better for the environment than cattle. And so uh, my argument as a dietitian is that it's absolutely preposterous that uh, meat generated in, in a factory or lab can be anywhere close to as good as real animal source proteins and fats that humans have been eating for three and a half million years. Um, and then I go into the environmental uh, benefits of well-raised cattle and why an ethical food system must include grazing animals as part of it. Thank you, Diana. Diana, is dairy a good substitute for meat? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you're getting right to all the best ones. So the only study that looked at, um, that was a randomized control trial. So most of the nutrition studies out there are observational, meaning they just, they just kind of look at populations. Okay. What did they report eating? And, oh, look, this population has, uh, more of this disease than the other. It must be this one food. And so, uh, really, those studies are only good at showing the bias of the researcher. And uh, you could take any food. Carrots, for example, are more commonly eaten in certain parts of the world than others. And so you could you could easily pon, uh, 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 pin a disease on carrots or mangoes or whatever you like. Um, so uh, the only randomized control trial that was done, so an experimental trial, on meat versus less meat was in um, a school in Kenya where the kids were undernourished. And one group got more meat as a supplement, 
one group got extra calories and one group got more dairy. And interestingly, the dairy group did the worst of all of that. So uh, the meat group did best and they were measuring for academic achievement, behavioral improvements, um, and physical ability. So the, the meat group, of course, did the best because meat is something that kids need in order to grow and thrive both mentally and physically. Um, but, uh, but then the next one was the over calorie group. And I'll bet that really surprised a lot of the researchers because, um, in many countries, I know all over Africa, the governments are substituting, um, you know, giving more milk, um, as a dietary supplement, um, to kids in schools. And the problem is dairy actually inhibits iron absorption, which is something that we need for good brain development and good physical development. Um, and especially to prevent stunting, which is, I think most common in India, um, as, as one of the leading, I mean, malnourishing, uh, malnourished children and stunting is, it's what's going on all over, uh, India and, uh, dairy is absolutely not a suitable replacement for, uh, animal source, flesh, protein, and fats. Thank you, Diana. Diana, what is the environmental footprint of uh, diabetes? All right. Well, so that's a good question. I talk about this in my book a little bit and you've done your research. That's good. Um, so Yes, I think that we need to be looking at, you know, when people say, can we feed the world, you know, this way, we need to look at our, do we want to just produce human feed or do we want to produce nutritious food that will not make people sick, right? Um, and currently what we're doing is producing human feed that makes people sick and it gives them diabetes. Um, in America, uh, over 70% of Americans are obese or overweight, um, interestingly, in a lot of Asian countries, you don't see a lot of obesity connected with metabolic problems. Um, so oftentimes people go, um, undiagnosed with, uh, things like type two diabetes because it presents differently in different body types, just depending on your genetics. Um, for example, even with me, I was in metabolic syndrome. I've never been, obese. I've never been, um, you know, grossly overweight, but I was in full metabolic, uh, syndrome X, um, uh, before I changed my diet and started going higher in protein and lower in carbohydrates. Um, and so we need to be not only looking at the environmental footprint of production, but also of consumption of these foods. Um, and that's where we need to be looking at things like dialysis, which is, uh, an end result of kidney failure from diseases like diabetes that are completely preventable with a better diet. And um, it, I believe type 2 diabetes, the country with the highest rates of type 2 diabetes is India, um, right? So, uh, so we need to be looking at, you know, missed work, uh, dialysis, all the lancets and the, and the plastics involved in tracking blood sugar, um, and all the associated diseases with amputations, blindness, all of these things need to be taken into account when we're trying to figure out the dietary footprint of a diet um, uh, of certain foods. And, and what we know is that when people are feeling satiated, they're generally going to eat less. Um, you are most satiated when you eat animal source proteins. They are the most nutrient dense, lowest calorie and most satiating foods we can possibly be eating. And so to vilify this on religious grounds or ethical moral grounds, in my opinion, as a, as a mother, as a dietitian, is unethical. It's absolutely unethical to be, you know, vilifying a nutrient dense food. Thank you, Diana. Diana, what is your opinion on Eat Lancet Report? Well, I wrote a big blog post about the Eat Lancet. Uh, so this is a, a, di a set of dietary recommendations that came from uh, a group based in Sweden, although Walter Willett was one of the authors. He's here in America at the Harvard School of Public Health. I did actually interview him for my film as well and um, got him to say that uh, it, it, Farmers have known for thousands of years that when you want to fatten up an animal, you put them in a pen where they can't move around too much and you feed them lots of grain and humans are the same. 
I think that that actually largely represents all of the problems that we have today in our nutrition guidelines, which Walter Willett actually represents a, a big part of this. Uh, and the Eat Lancet diet is very heavy in grains, very, very low in dietary protein, especially from animal source foods. Uh, you're allowed to eat only um, a quarter of an egg a day or an eighth of an egg, I can't remember, uh, the size of about a blueberry's worth of uh, red meat. And yet you can have, I believe it was eight teaspoons worth of sugar. I, I, I calculated it all out and wrote it in the blog post. Um, very little attention was given to uh, diets that are culturally relevant in other parts of the world, other than um, you know wealthy European uh, countries and, and Western Western countries. Um, and there was an email that was exchanged where the researchers admitted that they actually didn't even have uh, any research uh, proving their environmental case at all for that diet. So, you know, the the reality is in most parts of the world, you can't just crop soybeans or wheat or corn. Animals are what thrives on the majority of our agricultural land because it's either too hilly or too dry or um, in the case of India, just not great infrastructure uh, to haul and store and process uh, a lot of the crops. And um, in these areas too, one monsoon, one, one bad storm comes and you've lost your entire year's work, right? Uh, animals can graze land that we can't crop. They're much more uh, resistant to storms. <laughs> uh, it's, much, it's much more secure as a, as a food source. It's much more nutrient dense and uh, as an income source for so many people living in poverty in, in the world. Thank you, Diana, for clarifying that. Diana, can you clarify about the greenhouse gas emissions issue? Okay, yes. Uh, so cattle are pinned as uh, destroying the world with cow farts. Um, and so to clear that up a little bit, first we have to um, acknowledge that cattle emissions are a very, very small percentage of our greenhouse gas emissions. So worldwide, they make up only 5% of greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation, um, energy production, consumerism, manufacturing, all of this is way bigger than cow farts. So that's number one. And it's actually not even cow farts, it's cow belching. That's the problem. But it's not really a problem because uh, it is part of a biogenic carbon cycle. So when you look at fossil fuels, we are extracting ancient carbon and methane from the Earth's core and pumping it straight into the atmosphere. So if you were to picture like one of those little biospheres where you've got like all the, you know what I'm talking about, those little plants and everything that are in a little glass tube, that would be like injecting it with brand new carbon and methane, right? As opposed to cattle, which are just using the existing molecules that are already in our environment. So they're eating the grass, they take in carbon in the form of grass, their uh, rumen produce, the bacteria produce uh, uh, methane as a byproduct of breaking down the cellulose material, which, by the way, would just emit greenhouse gases if we didn't feed it to cattle. So it's not like the cattle are actually making this worse. Uh, this is part of normal breakdown of cellulose material. So when the cattle exhale this methane, it goes into the atmosphere for approximately 10 years, where it then is converted to H2O, which is water, uh, which becomes part of the water cycle, rain, clouds, things that we need in the atmosphere, uh, and CO2, carbon dioxide, which is then in turn taken up by the plants. The O2 oxygen is released, and that's what we breathe, and we need that to happen. And then the carbon is taken up by the grass, uh, part of that carbon becomes the actual grass. Part of it goes to make up the structures of the roots. And then part of that carbon is actually leaked down into the soil where it's fed to microbes and fungal networks, which eat those carbons, the sugar, in exchange for nutrients that the plants need. So the fungus is actually down in the soil, mining minerals, uh, from rocks and things and pulling it up and feeding it to the roots of that grass in exchange 
for the grass to feed it carbon. So it's this sort of symbiotic relationship that's happening underground. Um, so all of this is part of a very natural cycle. Up to 40% of this carbon actually gets stored in the soil as sequestered carbon um, and is building new soil. So uh, we absolutely need grazing animals as part of a healthy grassland situation. If we didn't have cows and other grazing animals chomping it, breaking it down, poofing it out and, and breathing out the methane, uh, then the grass would just lay down and die and oxidize, um, releasing greenhouse gases. Um, but the, it, would further, it would just turn into desert, which is what's happened in many places of the world. So we, you, wherever there's a healthy grassland, you must have healthy uh, grazing animals as part of that. Thank you so much, Diana. Diana, what is your opinion on our current agricultural practices? Well, currently our industrial agriculture practices are exploiting uh, our resources, the soil, and turning it into dust pretty much and um, per using chemicals to produce garbage food for humans. Um, you know, humans can survive on lots of different on lots of different foods. Uh, we really biologically only need to make it towards reproductive age, like according to, uh, you know, evolution, right? Like we just need to make it so that we can reproduce and, 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 uh, and raise our young to a certain age. But, um, what ends up happening as a result of this poor diet is that then we end up with chronic long-term expensive to maintain, uh, uh, medical conditions that, um, are painful, uh, lead to such a poor quality of life and are completely avoidable with just a change in diet. Um, and unfortunately money from agriculture is in turning raw ingredients into a new item. It's not in those raw ingredients. And so there's much more money to be made in things like, um, ultra processed plant-based burgers than there is in just a regular beef burger, which isn't actually really processed at all. It's just like chopped up meat. Um, and so there's a lot of incentives worldwide, especially coming out of the USDA, to promote commodity agriculture. In fact, that's the USDA's job, is to promote commodity agriculture. And ironically, they're also the ones making up our dietary guidelines, telling us what to eat, which of course is largely uh, commodity based agriculture. And so there's just an inherent conflict of interest there. And what happens in the U S it happens worldwide. It, uh, the dietary pyramid, if you were to look up that graphic in all, uh, most other countries, there's a version of that everywhere. So I've seen, uh, pagodas that have a pyramid. I've, I've seen igloos. I've seen, uh, this dietary pyramid, uh, replicated throughout the world. And, you know, people are looking to the U.S. as an example, unfortunately, because we're so sick. Um, but we're, you know, e even in developing countries where the traditional diet is is quite nutrient dense and healthy, people are being led to believe that that is the wrong thing to eat and that they should be instead converting to ultra processed vegetable oils and um, ultra processed uh, other garbage foods because that's the sign of progress, right? Thank you, Diana. Diana, can you walk us through the thought experiment you always mention? Okay, grass world. Um, so this, uh, this, I came up with, with Rob Wolf, we were actually, uh, I remember where we were sitting, just talking about how can we, how can we explain why biodiversity is so important to people in like a, a story form instead of just telling them that it's important, right? Um, we're big fans of uh, an author called Daniel Quinn, who wrote a book called Ishmael, which um, is largely telling, teaching people stories based on these little thought experiments. Um, and so we decided to tackle it this way. So if you were to imagine a planet that had the same weather patterns as earth, maybe just on the opposite, you know, end of the solar system. Um, and let's just say, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit that it's just covered in grass, right? And we want to create a sustainable food system. Well, we need to keep this grass 
clipped. We need to, you know, you can't just let it grow and oxidize and die. We need to be uh, stimulating it to grow and you do that by cutting grass. So we could either go in there with lawnmowers or we could have an animal go in there that could eat it and do it for us. And so we decided to populate the, the uh, planet with cattle. And so we're going to call this now cow grass world or grass cow world. Um, but then unfortunately, when you come back a few years later, the cows are all dead and the grass is all dead. Now, why did this happen? This happened because the cattle over multiplied and overpopulated, ate all of the grass and then the grass died and there was nothing keeping the cattle in check. So, um, round two, we, we know that the cows are probably a good idea we want to put, you know, replant the grass, but how could we keep the cattle population in check and, you know, harvest some of these cattle uh, while also keeping it so they don't overgraze certain patches and undergraze other patches, which is what happens when they just have full access. Because grass, a pasture isn't just like one type of grass, it's many different plants and cattle will preferentially eat certain ones over others, right? So when they do that, they eat their favorite ones, those die, and then the the ones that they like less will grow like crazy and seed and end up taking over the pasture. So how do we prevent overgrazing, undergrazing, and keep their numbers in check? We introduce a predator. So then this version, we're going to put some wolves on uh, the planet in addition to the cattle. And what magically happens now is that the cattle aren't staying in one spot too long because they have to keep on moving because they don't want to be just, you know, sitting ducks for the wolves to come and, and eat them. Uh, but the wolves are able to get some of them and it keeps the cattle population in check. But what's happening with the movement of these cattle is that they're not undergrazing certain areas. They're eating right where they are as fast as they can. And then they're moving on, giving what they just grazed a rest. So this is a beautiful dynamic that's happening here, but what if a fungus came and took over the grass, then everything would die, or a virus came and attacked the wolves, everything would die. So that's why the healthiest ecosystems on the planet are the ones that have the most uh, diversity of life, the most different types of plants, the many different types of predators, many different types of grazers, uh, many different types of insects to pollinate the, you know, we want as much life teeming in the one area as possible in order for it to be as resilient as possible. So the more complex, the more resilient. So then when we apply that to our agriculture system, what have we created um, with these large fields of just corn or just wheat? We've created grass world where it's extremely delicate. And if one virus comes, I mean, we've seen this in the banana industry, right? Where um, one virus came, wiped out every single banana that we had, uh, and we had to go and find a brand new breed of banana to plant everywhere, right? Um, and so the only way that we can protect these very weak ecosystems from complete devastation is to use really intense chemical agriculture, pesticides, insecticides, um, and, you know, lots and lots of fertilizers to help them grow. But what we're doing in the process is destroying the soil um, and especially destroying the underground microbial populations. And so um, the healthiest way to produce food is to have as large a variety of um, life as possible. And so we don't necessarily need to have wolves eating all of our meat. We can actually harvest the cattle ourselves. Um, and we can move these cattle with electric fencing so that they're not overgrazing or undergrazing certain areas. So that's the idea behind, um, what some people call holistic plan grazing or mob grazing or adaptive multi-paddock grazing, cell grazing. There's a lots of different, um, people that have come up with their own words for this idea. But the basic idea is that you cannot just have all of the animals have complete access to just one pasture for the entire season. They must be concentrated in a certain area and moved frequently in order for the healthiest uh, pasture to, to make it, yeah. Thank you so much, Diana. Diana, how cattle helps in regenerating barren lands? 
in regenerating barren lands. So in the film, we go and visit the Chihuahuan Desert, but there's many other places in the world that people are, are also using cattle on very desertified lands to actually restore them back into grasslands. Um, so one way is that the cattle are actually using their hooves to break up this hard pan on the top of the soil um, because uh, over time, when we've got just exposed dirt, uh, it, the the top becomes almost like concrete. And so it um, when it does rain, the rain actually can't make it in. It just runs off completely. So the cattle are able to disturb it a little bit with their hooves to break it up so that the water can actually penetrate. And in most places, there's a seed bank just waiting for those right conditions in order to grow. And so when the, when the moisture comes either from cattle urine or manure or from, uh, the next rainfall, those seeds can actually germinate and, and come up. And then when we have just the right amount of animal pressure on an area, so the right amount of grazing, not too much, not too little, um, uh, moved off at just the right time to allow that area to rest, then we can see a return of grasslands, which then means that's habitat for endangered bird populations. That's, um, you know, you see, uh, especially like salamanders and frogs come back because you'll, you'll have more water collecting in certain areas. And so you have a much richer variety of wildlife as well as, you know, healthier cattle and, and healthier plant life as well. Thank you, Diana. Dana, what is your opinion on lab meat? On lab meat? Well, uh, we talked about it a little bit before, I guess, when I was talking about the fake meats. But uh, lab meat is something that a lot of people are so falsely pinning their hopes on. Um, it's, I think humans have this idea that technology and anything that humans create can be better than anything that's already existing in nature. Um, so there's a lot of ego involved in something like lab meat. I mean, even the ridiculous idea that we should be colonizing Mars instead of maybe looking at what we could do in Antarctica, right? Or, or cleaning up the mess we already made here, right? Uh, it's just ridiculous. And so um, lab meat makes absolutely no sense. Um, in so many ways, it you a lot of people don't realize that you actually have to have a monocrop in order to go in to produce this lab meat. And so whether it's corn or soy or cotton or, or some kind of mass produced uh, monocrop under chemical agriculture, um, then you have to bring it into a lab and use high energy processes in order to convert that into um it is something edible and most people aren't even also talking about the heavy antibiotics that would be required because these are the perfect conditions um, to grow meat, but also the perfect conditions to grow pathogens as well. So uh, it, it makes no sense uh, when we aren't even efficiently using the pasture land that we have to uh, have natural animals converting photosynthesis, free energy uh, into meat, which uh, it can easily happen in so many places. Thank you, Diana. Diana, what do you say to the people who say that uh, taking less proteins increase our longevity? So there's this really funny obsession with longevity happening right now in the health space. And unfortunately, a lot of people are forgetting that sarcopenia is a really big problem. And so do we want to just live a long, weak life or do we want to live a good life? You know, um, so I would take a healthy life over a long, sick life any day of the week. And I think we need to be really uh looking at what conditions, uh, sarcopenia, which is the, um, when your body isn't getting enough protein, it's going to get it somewhere. And so it'll take it from your muscles. And so, uh, this is the biggest problem that elderly people face right now. And, um, as we get older, we're less able to break down proteins in our stomach. And so, um, there's 
pretty good evidence that anyone over 40 should be eating at least double the recommended daily allowance of, of proteins. Um, I start everyone at at least double the RDA of proteins in my nutrition practice, and it's a great way to balance weight, uh, gain it or lose it, depending on what your body needs to do. Um, but also just have more energy, be more productive, feel better, put on muscle, um, and be a stronger person so that if you do fall, it doesn't uh, destroy your life and you don't end up in a nursing home with more longevity, but you're in a nursing home the whole time. Thank you, Diana. Diana, why do many nutritionists are unable to come out of their bubble to be open-minded? Well, we're taught to regurgitate information that we're taught, right? Instead of questioning things. And so there's that problem right there. Um, you know, we're, people going through the dietary programs here aren't often taught how to be critical of information and make up their own opinion about things. And all good scientists should be doing that. We should be questioning our bias. We should be reading new research that comes out. We should be constantly looking at uh, new tools that we could be using to help people with diseases. Uh, for example, the carnivore diet and, uh, gut health. I mean, I've, I have several patients that are thriving, um, just from eliminating plants. Now, does that mean I think everyone needs to eat this way? No, but as a dietitian, I think that it's a really important tool that we need to be considering when we're, um, you know, looking at different ways to treat people. And it makes a lot of sense. If you just take out all the potentially offensive toxic uh, compounds that uh, some people just aren't able to process at all, um, you know, some of them are thriving. And so uh, I happen to be pretty open-minded and able to read research and uh, like to form my own opinions. And I have the research to, to, to back it up. Um, and so... Unfortunately, it takes a long time in academia to change things, and that's partially because of the way academia is set up, because um, all of these people churning out these you know, new papers based on this one uh, set of data from the NIH, um, based on food frequency questionnaires, which aren't even scientific, um, but yet there's like a new paper coming out every single week, right? Oh, it must be the, it must be the TMAO. It must be the, you know, it's ridiculous. Um, but people have built their entire academic career on publishing anti-meat papers. And so it would not be beneficial to them to, uh, then come out and to say that they were wrong. It wouldn't, it wouldn't look good to the, the corporations that are funding them, um, and it wouldn't look good for their ego. And I think that we need to look at funding for nutrition research and get large corporations out of it. Um, or at least be a lot more critical. Like when we're looking at a study for canola oil, right? Uh, the, the, there was a study that, that was published not too long ago out of Canada showing that, you know, canola oil was great and it was a Mediterranean diet with canola oil versus a standard American diet. Oh, it must be the canola oil. Who funded the study? The canola industry, you know. Um, and so people have, you know, the media has got to stop reporting, you know, observational research as if it's causal. Um, so there's a lot of problems and I don't even, I'm overwhelmed at where to start. Um, I think actually getting more regenerative grazing is going to be a lot easier than changing dietary guidelines and nutrition dogma, unfortunately. It's Diana. Diana, now we have questions from subscribers. So first question is, is it affordable to eat meat every day? That's a good question. When you line up the nutrients that you're getting in animal source foods, so we're not just looking at, you know, calories. We have to look at how are we going to pay for B12 and iron and uh, protein, right? So we have to be looking at spending on food differently than, you know, a pound of beans versus a pound of meat because those are not nutritionally equivalent. So you can get 30 grams of protein from a four ounce piece of steak, which is about 200 calories, or you can eat 
750 calories worth of beans and rice uh, with all those carbohydrates and still not get the same nutrients. You could get the same amount of protein, but you're still lower in vitamins and minerals than you would be if you were to eat the steak. And so um, it's unfortunate that, you know, things like uh, Twinkies here in America, these little processed food cakes are more, uh, are cheaper than apples, but it's, there's a, the system is broken as far as all the subsidies we pay farmers to ensure that, um, they'll make a living growing these garbage foods. Um, but, uh, you know, people also need to understand that, you know, your health is the most important thing that you have. And so, uh, if you want to avoid long-term pain and, and, and suffering of yourself, it's important to invest earlier in as high a quality diet as you possibly can. Thank you, Diana. Then next question is, what is your opinion on China study? Oh, the China study. Ah, yes, I think it's complete b BS. Um, I don't even know where to start on that, but I can tell you that the um, publisher of the China study is the same publisher of my book. Yes. So, uh, they, they fully endorse my book and, um, in the nutrition section of my book, we pretty much slam down the China study in every single way. That's a perfect answer. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, uh, next question is recently some studies shown that eggs causes diabetes. Can you talk about that? Eggs causing diabetes. Oh. So again, these are not causal. These are just, oh, look at this population ate more eggs and they have more diabetes and this other population that ate less eggs, it must be the eggs. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And when, you know, people like to say that this research is good because of the cigarette industry. Um, and, you know, we, we, we know from the cigarette industry, we didn't have to do any randomized control trials and that, you know, people who developed lung cancer, it, the smoking was a direct cause. And so we can then apply this to nutrition. Right. Um, but the problem is with cigarettes, it's a 30,000 time more chance of getting all forms of cancer versus, you know, what they've found in only some studies, not all, where there's, you know, maybe your general chance of getting cancer, uh, like with bacon, for example, and lung cancer, or sorry, colon cancer, your general chance of getting colon cancer, like everyone in the whole population is 5% right? If you were to eat five slices of bacon every single day for the entire rest of your life, your chance of getting colon cancer goes from 5% to 6%. So the media reports this as a 20% jump because from 5% to 6%, it's 20% more, right? 20% more chance. Oh my God. That's not even two times, right? With cigarettes, it's 30 times, so 3000% more chance of getting cancer. Um, so anything that's even less than a two times risk for anything is statistically irrelevant. Um, so eggs causing diabetes is that's ridiculous. Thank you, Diana. Diana, last question. Would you like to issue a seven day challenge to our subscribers? <laughs> um, yes. Okay. For the next seven days, logging your protein intake. Uh, I like the app chronometer, C-R-O-N-O-M-E-T-E-R, or do you have access to that one? Okay, so using chronometer, try to get at least 100 grams of protein for the next seven days, every single day. And I'll bet most of your subscribers are not. I actually eat way more than that, and I, I usually recommend even more than that for most people. But even just starting at 100 grams of protein per day, and it doesn't have to be beef if people don't have access to beef. It can be fish or chicken. Uh, I would challenge anyone to do this on a plant-based diet and not go over 2,500 calories a day because I don't really know how that would be possible. Um, lentils are the lowest calorie plant-based protein source without then diving into the processed proteins. Um, but still 30 grams of protein from lentils is 400 calories. 
twice as much as what you can get out of a steak, four times as much than from fish. So uh, try to keep your calories under 2,500 and get 100 grams of protein. Thank you so much, Diana. And uh, once again, thank you so much for coming to the show and helping us to become more healthy. Thank you for having me. Please subscribe to BNS Goku Great.